Montana is, as Governor Schweitzer points out, um, the headwaters of, of clean water that's left in the United States. Yeah, there's no question an ounce of prevention is worth a ton of cure. And there's no, no more dramatic example of that than in river conservation. Theodore Roosevelt concluded, he said, it simply adds to the beauty of life and the joy of living. And I don't want to be the generations that let this happen. Water is needed by every living thing, and we have that human right to live who we are, but also the human right to clean water. The whole concept of wild and scenic, I think, goes back to the basic uh, foundation of what we are as conservationists and, in turn, what we are as Montana citizens. Because I don't think you're going to find very many Montanans that are going to say, geez, I want to turn this all into an open pit mine, uh, or I want to turn this all into a wheat field. What we are is where we are. Montana is an interesting state, and, and it may be because we have such an abundance of natural resources that nobody is working that hard to maintain them. And today is another turning point. You know, now the changes, you know, the guard is let down, now the changes are going to happen again. The locals called East Rosebud Creek, meaning the whole area, is kind of left like it always was. And so everything is kind of like in a, in a, in a big harmonic balance. I started about two years ago. We learned back in 2010, I think it was. Uh, we talked to a neighbor and she found a legal notice in the carbon copy news. My wife got into it right away. My neighbor saw it in the carbon copy news. She called me or sent me an email, I don't remember, and I looked at it and I was like, I don't know. Hydropower I like. The uh, company was filing for, for permits to put up hydroelectric dams. A, a small dam somewhere up here. We just have this concrete wall, eight feet high, 100 feet wide. A couple miles of piping uh, diverting that flow to a powerhouse. And, uh, a run-of-the-river hydro project like what's proposed here would actually dewater a stretch of river. Most people don't want it, but a lot of people are afraid to say something. It would take the water out when the water is important for so many of these things, the fish, the fisheries, the fishermen. I think it will change what's happening in that river all the way down. It's just not good to change nature everywhere. We, we've developed a lot of the world, but we don't need to develop the last little bit, too. Uh, I'm not too sure people would come out here to say, oh yeah, let's go to East Rosebud and look at the hydroelectric dam. It ain't gonna happen. It ain't gonna happen. of species here, all think about weeds like house tongue and knapweed and so on, but there's aquatic uh, nuisance species too. 
they are invasive uh, that, that can take over if the uh, water flow is not enough. You know, dams ha also have a, a number of other um, issues that they cause. That they tend to change temperature and flow regimes. Um, they change the amount of sediment that uh, gets transported in the water. And they block sections of river from fish migration. 75% of uh, Montana's wildlife depend upon riparian areas along streams and rivers for at least half of their life cycle. Dams and development right up to the edge of the river change the nature of the river. It can degrade the water quality. And the more riparian zones we take away from the river, the weaker the biological life is in that river. And so we're always going downhill. You know, you could defeat a hydroelectric proposal now, and it could come back in a year, five years, or 10 years. And I don't think the people that live around here want to keep fighting that battle. Hydroelectric dams and hydroelectric projects are really useful in some places. You know, there are a lot of proposals to add hydro to existing dams that don't have hydropower generating capacity, to add them to more industrial or agricultural ditches to create an added benefit um, of hydroelectric from water that's already flowing through man-made structures. You know, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act was designed to protect rivers just like these rivers by creek. I would say maybe the Wild and Scenic River Act is even more important now than it was back then. To, to designate a section of a river wild and scenic does not change the use of that portion of the river. It doesn't lock anybody out. You know what it really does? It makes a trip better. Wild and scenic designation would mean that projects that change the river flow would not be allowed. One thing wild and scenic designation does that really no other protective strategy does at the local level is it protects a river forever. So in, in the end, we, we have to find a balance of natural areas and developed areas. Man's never been good at at balancing, rebalancing nature. Yes, and that was the idea behind the Wild and Scenic River Act was that we develop something, but at the same time, when we develop something here, we should, about the same area, we should protect somewhere else, somehow strike a balance, what we develop and what we don't develop. It's actually a pretty simple process, but pretty difficult to execute. The process is essentially the managing agency, in this case it's the Forest Service that manages this land. They have to find a particular river eligible for wild and scenic designation. And to be eligible, that river has to be free-flowing, undammed, and possess one or more what they call outstandingly remarkable values, or just special values. And those special values could be fisheries, wildlife, scenery, recreation, geology, there's a whole bunch. So if a river is free-flowing, has one or more special values, it can be found eligible for designation. And the Forest Service has found East Rosebud Creek eligible for wild and scenic designation. Uh, once that happens, it's really up to local people to approach their congressional delegation and ask them to introduce a bill in Congress to protect it as wild and scenic. And that's the difficult part to execute. It's kind of simple in concept, but you really need to build local support. So you need to get local homeowners, local guides and outfitters, your local county commissioners, the business community. If you can demonstrate that widespread grassroots support for protection of a river, um, then the, the congressional delegations will be much more likely to introduce a bill. And then it's as simple as Congress passing the bill, the president signing it, and you have a wild scene.
instance, only very few rivers qualify. I think the number is it's about 0.6% of rivers and or streams and in Montana are eligible according to studies for wild and scenic, and that's all. The Wild and Scenic Rivers Act is one of the few really good pieces of environmental legislation we have. You know, the Endangered Species Act, and Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. And there are still a lot of places that that could be protected. And, uh, you know, like I said, we haven't had a new wild and scenic river designated in Montana in 36 years. And other states all around us, like Wyoming, Idaho, and Utah, are protecting their rivers. And it's time to, uh, for us to catch up. Uh, we think Montana has some of the most spectacular rivers on the face of the earth. And uh, many of them are deserving of wild and scenic protection. So East Rosebud is just one of many. wonderful idea, so why has it been so sparingly used? You know, the old saying, we dropped the ball. I mean, would you say we dropped the ball? You know, Craig had decided to call it Wild and Scenic Rivers, and he was smarter than the rest of us, and he's older than the rest of us, so, you know, I think I agree with him. You know, to put it in perspective, it's probably, you know, one of the best pieces of environmental legislation, and just the fact that my dad and my uncle help write it uh, makes me proud. <laughs> authorities back in Washington realized that if they wanted to have clear, bright uh, water running down those rivers so that you could bend down and take a drink anywhere you wanted, that they had to have some pretty strong regulatory measures. Recognize that you don't have these kind of rivers just anywhere. It's not a matter of protecting this river or that river. It's a matter of given protection to all those rivers. It doesn't require much more than having Congress understand how important those rivers are to all Americans. They're about as American as an American can be.
And as far as rivers go, you know, I mean, how do you put a value on that? I mean, they don't make rivers anymore. You know, I've based my whole life around this river. Uh, I'm, I'm directly linked to it. Where, where our efforts need to be spent are just conserving what we already have. It's like putting something in the bank for the future. If nothing else, if we, if we totally destroy the rest of the state with our runaway economies and, and stupid mining projects and, and whatever, and we're smart enough to protect the very best, we've done the minimum of what we should do. Thank you.